Yeah, thank you, Nico. Thank you very much for inviting me and to organize the event. It's, it's quite interesting, and I hope you can contribute a bit uh, with some work we did. So I will talk a little bit about the work we did in Italy over the last two, three years uh, about reinforcement learning and uh, how to add social component when designing tasks of reinforcement learning. Because that's something that we, uh, so as Nico mentioned, I come from a more effective computing background. So my research was always interested on, I was always interested on understanding how people behave, how people communicate, and how this can be detected and modeled by computational systems, in particular robotics, and how this can change the robot behavior, paying attention on how the people are talking and their emotions and uh, developing empathy and things like that. And um, when I moved to Italy, we, we um, approached this subject uh, over uh, improving interactions with robots, with autonomizations in this case. And reinforcement learning was uh, the solution we found for it. However, I mean, reinforcement learning, it's became quite popular in the last, uh, I don't know, five, 10 years because of the big advancements we have in representation learning, uh, deep learning, deep reinforcement learning, this became quite, quite uh, highlighted and allow it to, to, to solve very complex problems like self-driving cars are actually a reality right now. Um, robotic behavior, robotic control, uh, and even games. You have agents who play to learn how to play very complex games just by looking to the screen of the computer, for example. And um, that's quite interesting. There is a lot of work on that. There is a lot of products already developed on that. So it's really uh, tested and validated and being used by people. However, the, there is a, a, a one characteristic of these systems that makes them not be usable or useful even for ro human-robot interaction or robotics in general, which is the aspect of ultra-generalization. Oops. Yeah. No, it works. All right which is the aspect of auto-generalization. These models, these solutions need a lot of data and a lot of interaction to learn something. So if you're training a reinforcement learning to, to, to play a game, for example, an Atari game, this agent needs thousands or millions of interactions and, and learning loops to learn something meaningful. And that becomes a problem when you have human in the loop because um, in interaction, you have a human, that's what you're doing, human robot interaction. Uh, but you cannot have a human to, to, to teach a robot to be part of the robot learning for one million interactions. Um, you just cannot, it's not feasible, it's very expensive. Uh, the work becomes quite complicated in general. So the data availability to train these models with the feedback from the human or getting information from the human becomes very, very scarce and becomes very, very difficult. And then that's where the auto-generalization uh, clashes with the idea of personalization because I also want the, this agent to deal with a human, a specific human, a specific type of human. Um, and that uh, interplay is not really clear yet and it's a big research field nowadays, but uh, um, it becomes difficult to solve it with the, the deep reinforcement learning or other models we have. Right? And then coming back from what we're doing in Italy is um, besides having the interaction with humans, we want to focus on the social aspects of this interaction. And that means, of course, social cues, taking consideration the face expressions, body movement, gestures, uh, voice modulation in general. Uh, then you go one level higher, which is interaction itself, how the engagement happens, how the physical contact between these persons happens, what's the social contract between these two persons, right? Communication, of course, plays a role, language, how we speak, not only what you speak, but how you speak, the conceptual representation of the conversation, what's the context of what you're talking about. And of course, uh, the individual aspects, every person has their own preferences, have their own bias, have their own beliefs, uh, and that has to be taken in consideration. If you take all this behavior, um, characteristics and variables into a reinforcement learning based on deep representation learning, you have a problem, right? Um, you would need to have so many persons to interact with this robot so many times to learn each of these aspects. Uh, in our case, we, we focus a lot on learning these personal preferences and how to address this problem of learning this individualism, how the robot can address uh, that specific person based on how that specific person behaves. And um, thinking of how to solve that, I mean, of course, we don't have 
infinite resources, uh, infinite persons. So we have to constrain the scenario. And the scenario we came out with uh, was games. Because uh, on games, specifically multiplayer games, you have a natural constraint scenario where you have a context which is known by the players, is a closed world scenario, so there is no interference from outside within while the game is happening. You have usually, or what we're looking for was a turn-based game that I have a natural flow of information. So first this guy, second this guy, third this guy, then comes back to this guy. So we know where it comes from and we we'll know where it goes. The social behavior must happen naturally in our games, in the scenarios we're looking for. Because we don't want, for example, in, we thought about a lot of the classical games like chess, uh, for example, but the social behavior in chess is very constrained, or poker. Uh, it's a very specific type of social behavior. You're more interested on the game, on the rules of the game itself, and not how people play it. Um, and we thought about, okay, let's think about all the card games, for example, which is the classic example. And I think the classic, most common example was Uno, where you have a social interaction, a social behavior that's actually part of the game and make the game funnier, makes the people more engaged, makes the people play the game differently, right? But uh, we had some problems with Uno. Um, and we had to, to think about how to constrain Uno. And we created our own card game to, to, do, to deal with that. Uh, one of the other characteristics, and this was a, a big one, was that uh, it was supposed to be easy to learn, very fast to learn, because I cannot have the persons playing the game 10 times before they start developing a strategy of how to play the game. That has to be very, very uh, easy to grasp. And this individual behavior must happen while persons are playing the game. So on this aspect, we thought a lot, and we came up with two solutions. Um, the first one was using the, the Pokemon battle game. I um, don't know if you guys know it, but it's a two players game where you fight each other with uh, avatars, which are the Pokemons. Um, and there is a lot of strategy learning. It's a relative, relatively easy game to learn, but very difficult to master. But there is an easy way to form strategies while playing the game. And uh, when you're playing face-to-face -face with someone else, you can display emotional behavior. You try to trick your opponent. You try to um, trigger your opponent to make a mistake while you're playing. Um, and on the card game, we decided actually to create our own uh, card game. So together with some collaborators from Eindhoven University, uh, they're, they're studying uh, industrial design. We actually created a card game based on Uno, based on other games that were, uh, was easier than Uno specifically easier to be played by a robot, because this was our main goal in the future, but that we have full control of the rules, that we can change the rules as we want, and uh, we have full control on how this game is played and disseminated. So um, our first experiments and our first uh, um, scenario that we evaluated was the Pokemon game, which is a turn-based game, so every player does an action, and this action can be uh, an attack, um, while fighting the, 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 the other uh, players' uh, Pokemon, um, which is quite simple. You just have attack or change your Pokemon. So that's the two actions the, the, the agent has to learn. However, the attack uh, option, each Pokemon has four types of moves. And depending on the type of move you have, you have a different effect. So you can create a strategy of which move you choose to affect the other player the way you want. You can take its uh, hit point, you can make it slower, you can make it weaker, make it stronger, and so on. So you can create these strategies while playing the game. Uh, it's a relatively longer game, so it's not only a single interaction. Each player has six avatars, six Pokemon that they have to fight, and uh, you have to defeat all of them to win the game, right? And the goal is to defeat your opponent like that. Um, and you do have the social cues, you try to understand what your opponent is thinking and how it's playing. You try to trigger it, make it more anxious, make it more nervous to make a mistake, for example. And while we collect the data for this scenario by um, making people play the game, we collect the data and we have uh, analyzed this data to see if there is some behavior happening. And by analyzing this data and doing some behavior analysis on it, we find out that people actually do display a lot of social interaction on the game. People do try to make your opponent anxious or nervous, making fun of it or, or pressure it to make a move to try to, to, to see if there is a mistake. But this is a player to player. So it's a very, uh, it's a two player based game. And we wanted something more complex, right? That's why we created the, the chef's head card game, which is a four player game. And again, as a turn based game, um, there is only two actions as well, uh, every turn you have two actions, discard a card or pass your turn. 
And uh, the idea of the game, I mean, we developed it in Italy. So of course, the idea of the game was uh, the theme of the game is cooking and to make a pizza is the final goal of the game. And every player receives in the beginning of the game a set of cards, which are representing ingredients. And you have to lay down the ingredients on the board and the board is a pizza dome. And whoever put more ingredients on the board, more points you get. So we make it more interesting for the persons to play. The rules are relatively easy, but again, difficult to master. Um, the game itself, it lasts longer. Uh, also, we make uh, every match has a certain set of points and you finish the game when someone wins a certain number of uh, limited points. We also recorded people playing the game. We also recorded uh, uh, and did analysis behavior, behavior analysis on that. And uh, we see that the social component here is even stronger because you have multiple players, because you have a fixed uh, um, turn-based scenario, so you know who is after who. And um, rivalry started to, to build up in the game very easily, but also cooperation. If I don't like a player, I join another player who doesn't like this player, and we play together to, to beat this guy. So I make uh, my moves, I change the way I play the game to make this guy lose. Not necessarily that I win, but to make this guy lose, for example, was a very interesting behavior that happened there. Um, so our first uh, um, step was actually to, besides choosing the scenarios and uh, validating it off, based on the goals we wanted, was actually to um, design and create the scenario specifically for the chef's head game. Um, we really created the game physically, and we designed the cards, and the cards are specifically designed for the game. There is a lot of interesting elements on it. We validated it by playing the game with persons, but we also created a simulator for it based on the gym, open and gym environment, uh, where we can make virtual agents play the game and follow the same rules that the, the, the game has on the real world scenario. I will go in more details on the rules of the game in the tutorial if you're interested, uh, but for here, I, I will skip it. But uh, we designed it in a way that any person can play the game against other persons, but also against the virtual agents. So we can replace a person by a robot, for example, or by an avatar, and the game will go on without any interference. That was quite interesting. So once we define these two environments, we have to define how to, how to transport it and how to create agents to play the game, right? So for the, for the Pokemon game environment, um, in the reinforcement learning, I think you guys also saw in the last talks, uh, we have the definition of states and actions. So what, what we receive, what these learning models or agents, we receive as input, what they know about the game and which actions they have to think, right? So for the, for the Pokemon battles, um, this game state that the agents have information about the game is 22 values representing which are the Pokemons left in the game their hit points and the moves available for you, for the agent. And uh, by looking into this information, the agent has to take a decision and to make an action. And in the Pokemon game, these are nine different types of actions, which are four types of moves, which moves I will use, or one of the other five Pokemons I can switch to. And uh, every turn, the agent receives this information and takes an action, receives this information and takes an action. For the Pokemon, it's a, it's a relatively small amount of, uh, the dimensions are small, but the complexity of the game is larger because you have nowadays over 1,000 Pokemons to choose from. So you can choose six out of 1,000 and more than 1,000 different types of moves and you have to choose four for each Pokemon. So the complexity of it becomes quite, quite uh, more complicated. For the chef's hat, the dimensions are a bit different, um, specifically the action. So the game state is composed by the amount of cards you have at hand. In the beginning of the game, everyone receives 17 cards. So you have the 17 cards you have at hand and the amount of cards that exist on the board. Because depending on the card that exists on the board, you have specific rules to which card you will discard. And that sums up to 28 values that the, the, the robot has information about the game on the traditional way. But um, there are 200 possible actions because you have a combination of cards you can discard. You can discard one card or two cards or three cards at the same time uh, of each of the cards. However, because of the rules of the game, uh, these possible actions change based on the board and the cards that you have at hand. Because uh, if you have a certain number of cards at hand and a specific board, you cannot do not necessarily all the 200 actions, but maybe only five or six. But then the next round, the possible actions you have are different. So we created this dynamic mask that changes uh, which possible actions you can have. Although the robot or the agent learns how to do the whole 200 actions. 
So our first step was, okay, we have the scenarios, we implemented them, we validated them, but now we want to uh, make agents learn how to play the game, how to build agents that learn the rules of the game and learn strategies to beat an opponent. And uh, we started developing these agents into uh, five different categories, starting very simple, what we call the dummy agents, which are agents who does random actions. So between the nine actions on Pokemon and 200 actions on of, uh, Chef's Hat, choose one action and do an action, choose an action and do an action, just to test, it's our baseline, right? After that, we have what we call the offline agents, which are agents uh, based on reinforcement learning, based on deep reinforcement learning, PPO, other uh, reinforcement learning algorithms uh, that learn with offline interactions playing against the dummy agents over thousands of interactions. So what we do is we create a game with four players. We implement, I don't know, deep key learning and one deep key learning agent and three random agents. And this agent plays the game and learns while playing the game. And these take it, I don't know, 1,000 interactions, 10,000 interactions, 10,000 games that the agent learned something meaningful and learned a strategy, which was quite time consuming, but was quite interesting because the agents could learn strategies to beat uh, the, the dummy agents always in both games. Then we created an imitation learning because, um, well, playing against dummy agents is very easy. They, they're doing random actions. As soon as you pick up or learn a very simple strategy, you can beat them most of the times. But humans are different. And what we did was we, we make humans play the game. So we had a total of, I think, 100 persons playing the game for the chef's hat and 100 persons playing the game for Pokemon, each of them playing 10 games only. We collected this data. And uh, we train offline agents to repeat the agents or the, the, the moves of each person. So we have agents so using imitation learning that uh, learn the strategy that this specific player learned. So we have 100 agents like that. We also developed then what we, 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 we saw that we needed was the online learning agents, which are agents who keep learning while playing the game. So they have this offline learning. They learn the rules of the game before. But if they face a novel opponent, they keep playing the game, they keep updating themselves, and they keep learning. And in the end, we uh, develop one type of agent, which is a competitive learning agent, which tries to not only win the game, but winning the game by making the other person lose very fast. So it was a very competitive agent. Right? Going a bit in details on each of them, um, both the offline agent and the imitation learning agent, we implemented three types of agent. <laughs> a deep key learning agent, an actocritic agent, and a PPO agent. And why we implemented three of them? Because we wanted to see if different learning rules, different learning mechanisms would derive or achieve different strategies. And that was the case, and that was quite interesting. They do learn the, how to play the game differently. They do learn how to play the game um, good, all of them, but uh, with different strategy, different ways of doing those. So. Um, the continual learning agents were a bit different uh, because in continual learning you have one specific problem which is catastrophic forgetting. If I learn a lot uh, offline and I start learning online while playing the game with different opponents, I run the risk, and it's a very high risk, of forgetting everything I learned before and adapting only to the new player I'm playing. And that's a problem because then you have an agent which is very specific to that specific player but cannot play the game against anyone, anyone else. To solve that, the solution is, uh, or one of the solutions, there are many, is to create uh, what uh, is called the uh, uh, prioritized experience replay. So that means instead of learning for every move I do with my new player, I collect these decisions I made, store it in a memory, together with all the decisions I made in the past with other people. And every iteration rule, every iteration uh, uh, um, every learning iteration I have against this other guy, I randomly select one information from this memory and I train and I update my model based on this information. So I guarantee that the new information uh, that I collected playing against this person is there, but I don't forget the other past information I have. The problem with that, specifically in our case, is because it makes learning slow, because I don't adapt to that guy very fast or specifically, but I adapt to everything else I know. So we propose a small change on it, uh, which we call the prioritize, uh, the person specific uh, prioritize experience replay, which creates a subset of memories for each player. And when I'm playing with that specific player, I have a higher, um, I have a higher learning modulation for that specific player. That means I still keep my memory, I still learn 
based on whatever I played before. But for that specific guy, when I am playing with it, I have a preference of uh, collecting memories when I played with him. And that helped uh, a lot. So on the left side, we have um, performance of each of these models, training offline and online. And uh, training on the right side, training offline and online with the uh, person-specific prioritized replay. And what we saw is uh, the performance when using the prioritized experience replay somehow increases, but very slowly. And because of scenarios we are planning to add with human, we cannot play the game 100 times, 1,000 times against a human. We, we set maximum 10 times. Uh, when using the person-specific, this adaptation and the performance of these models towards that person increase very fast and very, very steep. And this is quite interesting to see. And the, um, the last type of agent we had was the competitive learning agent, uh, which we call the, the winner uh, agent. And that was, uh, is a bit more, uh, it's not even complex, but it's a bit, uh, the, the stream of the, the flow of information is different. On this agent, we have two different uh, uh, models, reinforcement learning models that learn different policies. One is a global policy learning that is trained offline. So this global policy is one of offline agents. Learns how to, and the rule of this global policy is to learn the rules of the game and the strategy of the game in a general perspective. However, when I'm learning and when I'm playing against a specific opponent, for every specific opponent I train, the model creates a local policy, smaller network, um, that receives the information from the global policy and updates this information based on what's happening in the game right now. Based on these two local and global policy, I have two outputs, I have two decision-making scenarios, and then this goes to um, a strategy predictor, which is a recurrent network that tries to predict the strategy that my opponent was taking. So based on the movements my opponent make, I try to memorize it and learn, ah, if this is the action I did, my opponent will probably make this action. And based on this strategy predictor, um, we can combine them, the local policy, the global policy, the strategy predictor, and make the model take an action that will both maximize the chance of the agent to win the game, but will maximize as well the chance of the opponent disrupt its strategy. So what's the chance that by making this move, I will break the strategy of my opponent? at the same time while I'm trying to make the game. And this uh, interplay of maximize, this was quite interesting to, to, to try out. And well, this was quite interesting and um, it performed much better uh, against the specific agents, uh, specific uh, agents more than the, the memory, for example, because it learned faster. It learned not only to win the game, but also to make the other guy learn uh, lose. So the, the time and the, the amount of examples it needed to win the game was, was much, much more reduced. Well, to evaluate all of that, um, we created different strategies, of course. Um, we tried, first of all, this offline learning and these learning agents playing against the random agents, which they did it quite well and they beat them very fast, very easily, very fast. But we also used the playing against myself uh, um, idea, which is very common on reinforcement learning for games. I create the different versions of the same agent and I make them play against themselves and I make them update themselves using a memory, a shared memory. So they play against better version of themselves every time they play a new game and that improves how they play the game. And of course, playing against others, uh, putting a type of agent playing against another type of agent and let them learn with each other and uh, it goes on. Uh, this was made in a tournament scenario. So we created uh, I think 60 something types of agents in total, or six, 64 instances of agents. And we put them to play the games together. That means um, we have repeated types of agents, which allow us, for example, if in the first round I played against a deep learning agent, could be that in the third round I play against a deep Q learning agent as well. So I learn already a strategy how to beat this type of agent, for example, and allow this to, to evolve and to be created. Um, this was done by us. At the same time, we created a competition in a, in a conference where we asked persons to create agents themselves. And uh, we run this competition to see what's the best agent. And we just run all the agents together. This was quite interesting. We, it was quite a fun thing to do and we learned a lot. And a lot of people participated with a lot of different ideas, but also allowed these agents to learn a lot. 
Right. So on this competition, I have very uh, summarized results, but the idea is on the, uh, oh, it's not, oh, you cannot read this so well, but on the upper level, you have the, poke, uh, the Pokemon scenario and um, on the on the x column on the x axis you have the number of games and y axis is the number of victories per agent and uh, on purple you have the the best agent for us was the competitive learning agent and you can see that um, it starts winning in the first games it starts winning quite okay together with the other agents but very fast it goes winning more and drops makes the other agents lose very fast so this was the biggest advantage of this model for example, also for the chef's head game on the on the lower end, the same behavior, right? When playing against online learning agents, agents who also change while playing the game, that was more difficult for the Pokemon scenario because it's much more complex. Although the competitive agent also, the purple one, also behaved and learned quite fast. For the chef's head, it did in the end uh, learn how to make the other agents lose also very fast, which was quite interesting. And of course, when playing against random agents, naive agents, there is no competition. They are just very bad from the beginning. So the, the, the agent could beat them very easily and even improve their behavior in the future. Well, this was quite interesting and we learned a lot uh, while developing these agents. However, these agents were only learning strategies based on the game itself, right? There is no social component uh, at all. But most importantly, it was very difficult to prove that these agents are actually learning a strategy. Because these games are very complex and the only way I know or the only way possible to identify that a strategy was learned is by having an expert on the game, watching the game and telling, ah, this guy's following this strategy, this guy's following this strategy. And that's, again, um, it's very costly resource-wise, right? So we started to think, okay, how can we extract some information from these agents? What, what kind of information we can extract? And um, I mean, the basic information we can extract from these models is the Q value. So which action was decided and when this action was decided with the highest confidence of this model, right? And for each of these models, uh, the typical learning, the actor critic and the PPO, you can see that every line is a different game and they do follow some certain of behavior. So while the deep learning does not have much confidence in the beginning of the game, by the end of the game, the actions it takes have higher confidence, it's specifically the last action it takes. It's the only action, or most of the times, it's the only action it has very high confidence on it. While the uh, actor critic one, specifically when playing against other type of agents, have a different behavior, it starts with a very good confidence on its actions, on actions, and decreases over time. The same for the PPO. And this also changes depending on which other player this this uh, strategy, uh, this agents learn uh, play against, right? Versus random agents versus other agents or uh, versus other agents that also adapt during the game. But it still is very difficult to, to, to get information of why the agent did this and what strategy it's actually learning, right? If you look for the key learning alone in one, in one game, you can see that it's also very weird because it's um, on this action, action number three, it has a very high confidence, but then the action level four has a very low confidence again. And goes on, goes on, goes on. So it's not consistently like, okay, I'm doing better on the game. I'm doing worse on the game. It's, this is very difficult to extract. And we try to address that. Um, so together with uh, Francisco, Francisco Cruz, which is also organizer of the event, we, uh, so he developed a confidence value uh, from the Q values, values itself. So it's a transformation from the Q values. And this confidence value gives the strength of the model. So from the perspective of the model, how confident I am that this action was a good action or a bad action. And um, that makes the information that we obtain from the Q value into a confidence value between zero and 100. I'm 100% sure that this was the best action I could take, or I'm not 100% sure that this was the best action I can take. Quite interesting and gives a better perspective, but still doesn't explain for us. I come from a uh, effective computing background. So I'm quite interested as well on how to represent intrinsic effect on humans and on the models on, on robots, right? If I experience something, this experience I had, it has an effective component. And this effective component usually is decomposed into arousal and valence. So how much positive or negative this experience was between 
zero and one, for example, negative and positive, which is a valence component, and how much excitement this experience causes on me between very calm and extra excited, uh, which is then arousal value. And if I combine arousal and valence uh, for a certain experience, I can identify if this experience was actually very good, very bad, or was just okay. And uh, the work we did and the, how we tried to, to address this was to transform the confidence values that we obtain from each agent into an arousal valence value. So given an intrinsic affective state for the agent while it's playing the game. Uh, so we can identify while playing the game, the agent can tell us, hey, I'm feeling good about the movements I'm doing, I'm feeling good about the actions I'm taking, until, oh no, I lost, I feel very bad about it, and then continues, right? This was done in a way, and this first step, of course, was to have an expert validating these actions. So the expert is telling every time you win the game, you get a boost on arousal and valence. Every time you lose the game, you get a decrease on arousal and valence. Or every time you make an action that your opponent made a mistake, you increase your arousal and valence. And that was our first step. And uh, based on that, we created what we call the Moody framework, which tries to um, uh, which has is, is a neural network that is attached to the agent, to the policy agent, uh, that creates a mood, the mood of the agent while you're playing the game. So what happens is, uh, based on the state and the action the agent took, we calculate the confidence that this action uh, um, created. So based on the agent's own interpretation of the action, how confident I am that this action was good or not. This is sent to a pleasure and arousal, arousal valence model, transforming this confidence into an arousal valence model. And this is stored in a memory. And this memory is a self-organized network, a growing or required network, which is a neural network that creates neurons on the go dynamically to represent memories that it has on the past. At the same time, it can forget uh, experiences had by removing neurons. That means if I train this network with arousal valence values, I can remember recent events, and depending on the amount of neurons I have that represent arousal, for example, if I have a lot of neurons that represent arousal, that means that the mood of the robot is high aroused. If this happens now, and then after 10 turns of the game, this do not happen, the number of neurons on the network are being removed every turn, and that means that the arousal of the robot is reducing over time. Right. At the same time, we can model our own mood and our own, uh, so the agent's own mood and self arousal valence. The agent can also model unexpected uh, arousal valence of the opponents based on the opponent's actions. So if the opponent make an action and the agent can't see this action because it's uh, discarding the card on the chef's head game, um, the agent can try to validate or to, to uh, create a confidence of its own knowledge about this action. So, Basically, it's judging the opponent. I made an action, the opponent made an action, and I say, hmm, I think this action was very bad. And then I create an expected mood for that opponent. So I think that guy is now not happy because this action, in my opinion, was bad. That is interesting because uh, in our case, we have these three different types of agents. Because they learn different strategies, they also have different interpretations of the actions they took. So a deep learning agent will have a completely different interpretation of an action than a PPO agent. And from its own perspective, its own learning, it's valid because it's how it, it makes these, their own actions. It, that was quite interesting. So in the end, what this does is to create a arousal valence reading that uh, different from the confidence and the, from the Q value, which is just spiking and, and uh, um, does it carry on, carrying over. With the mood reading on the rouse of valence, we can see it, it kind of carries on. If I make a good action, my next action is still somehow validated or somehow affected by this good action I did in the past. And if I do another good action, my arousal valence increases. If I start to do bad in the game, my arousal valence decreases, decreases, decreases until the moment that I'm very bad. Until the moment I win the game and I get a boost on it, for example. So you have a, the agent has a self-awareness of its own behavior much more fine-tuned than the Q-value itself, right? Um, the plan is to use this to modulate the agent's behavior. So right now, these agents don't have an identity, don't have a face, or is, uh, is not, they are not an avatar or a robot. But if this is a robot, for example, it can use this information to express something. Every time it's excited, it will express with a movement, a body movement, or a mouth, or a face movement, or something like that. And that changes also the behavior of the game. 
And that's our next steps on this project. Well, once we did this and we did understand how these agents learn and what they learn and uh, how we can represent this learning into an effective component, our last step was actually to add the social component on it. Because right now, all these agents, they are only playing the game uh, against themselves. And uh, most importantly, they're only observing the game itself. They're not observing how the other players uh, behave right, while playing the game. And uh, the first social component we, we addressed was the idea of rivalry. And rivalry was quite interesting. We observe on both games, but it fuels the player to be more engaged on the game. It fuels the player to be more efficient and fuels the player and it makes the player to be more uh, social, more um, display, more social behavior. And what we wanted to do is try to mod the rivalry into the game, right? Based on the game state and based on how people play the game. And uh, we did model it as a composition of two different factors or, or three different factors that are falling in two different categories. One is a subjective category, my perception about the other player, in particular, how similar this other player is from me. Competitiveness, how competitive I am and how competitive I think the other player is. And the performance, because if I have a, if I'm much, much better than everyone else, rivalry does not happen because I'm much better, I don't care. If I'm much, much, much worse than everyone else, usually rivalry does not happen as well, or there is a low level rivalry because I know that I am very far away and I'm not motivated to play, right? So combining these three components, we created a rivalry score that represents the motivation to win the game and to be engaged in the game, right? To be able to run this experiment, we created a chef's hat online, which is a platform, a web platform, a website that allows players to play the game following the same rules uh, on the simulator, the same rules on the real game against other players, which can be humans and can be agents. And this can be played in the browser that allowed us to collect quite some data because this was done all of it during the pandemics, which was a big problem for us because we could not put people in the same room to play. So we created a website and we distributed the email for people to play the game and to collect data for us. So we did that. We first step was to uh, collect the data from the persons while playing the game. And we collected from 20, I think 25 persons playing 10 games each online against three different agents. And um, what we did was asking the persons to play the game, asking also the persons to evaluate the agents and give the agents a personality rating based on three components, agency, communion, and competence. Every, uh, each of the agents was given one of these values. And we create a neural network that uh, receives as input the strategy the person is doing, so the actions the person, the agent is doing, and try to map these actions with the personality rate this agent was given by the humans. So this neural network actually can detect personality or levels of agency, communion, and competence, personality traits, based on how the person plays the game. And that was quite important and for us because it allows the agent now, from the perspective of the agent, to have an opinion about the opponent in terms of personality. The agent can detect if the person is very competent or not, for example, while playing the game. Um, and that defines the similarity because every agent has a, a personality trait and can detect the opponent's personality trait and then they calculate how much similar they are or, or not. The other level, the, the other uh, variable we calculated was competitiveness, and these we use the confidence values. So based on the agent's own knowledge, I will evaluate how competitive I am, how confident I am that my actions are doing well, and how confident I am that the, my opponent actions are also good. So I can evaluate if they are competitive against me or not. And the relative performance, of course, is how many points I have difference from my opponent, and this changes on the game. Combine these three components, we came up with a rivalry score. So a value of rivalry, how much rivalry I have against that specific component, and that changes while the game is being played. Right. And the idea of this rivalry score was to, to use it as a reward, as an extra reward to the agents. So the agents maximize uh, the chances of winning the game. So it gets a game reward. Every time I win the game, I get a higher reward, but also try to maximize the rivalry. So changing the behavior of the agent to win the game but win the game in a way that makes the rivalry against a certain opponent, in this case, the humans, higher. And uh, what we observe 
on, on this uh, uh, scenario. So we have the 25 persons, uh, each of them play 10 games, and we have a constraint of reaching 15 points. Every game the person wins, the person gets three points. So that means each player played maximum or minimum five games. And uh, what we observe is when the players played against the rival agent, the agent that maximizes rivalry, uh, you have, a, of course, a higher high rivalry score against this agent. You had a higher number of matches before reaching 15 points. That means it was more difficult for the humans to win the rival agent. And uh, the agent, the, the persons were more engaged. Also, in question as we ask, the persons were more into the game uh, before the rival agent. After the fourth game, so by the end, the person was already bored because it was so easy to beat the other agents. Right. And uh, most very important, there is a small relative performance between the rival agents and the humans. So they are effectively more difficult to beat. Right. And um, that was quite interesting because it shows that the agents are the same. They are still trained to play the game based on the game behavior, on the game rules. But by just adding and changing one small component about personality trait, about uh, competitiveness, we can already make a huge difference on the person perspective of the game. And that's where we stopped uh, last year. And uh, now we are collaborating uh, and we are developing new ideas um, in four different areas. And this is spreading right now. First is to use this interesting effective component as a learning modulator. Right now, this intrinsic effect gives a mood of the agent, but this is not used to change the agent behavior. And we have a student in Genova now trying to use this information to change the behavior the agent plays the game based on its own mood. Right. The other important information is uh, the other important uh, characteristic we're trying to, 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 to change is right now, the agent does not have an identity. The agent is just a name in the screen. What we want to do is give the agent an identity, a face, a body, or a, in maybe a robot body or an avatar face. But most important, that this face changes and the way the robot behaves changes during the game. And we want to see if that, for example, increases the level of rivalry because you have an embodied concept that you're playing against, not only a name in the screen, not only a bot, but you have something which is more connected to you, emotional-wise. We want to develop this in the robot. This was the plan since the beginning, but because of the pandemics, this was becoming way more complicated, specifically running this uh, human robot interaction scenarios with the robot became impossible because we could not put people in, this, in, the, in, the, in the same room. But now things are getting better in Italy. So uh, we plan to, to adapt the game to be played by the iCub robot. Uh, and of course, cooperative actions. Right now, everything we did was about competition, how to beat the other opponent. But specifically in the chef's hat, you have four player games. And what happens, what we observe is that these four players, uh, they do not are always competitive against each other. Sometimes they form groups and two players try to beat a player which is stronger or, or has a better strategy than them. And this happens naturally. And to, to, to foster this cooperative behavior would be something quite interesting as well. And yeah, so for me, that's it. Uh, if you're interested in the things we do, the entire Chef's Hand um, resources are online and available. You can download the environment, you can download the, the Chef's Hat online, which is the website to play the game. And you can even download the, all the players we created, all the agents we created already trained, so you can use them also the way they are. Um, okay. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, on the tutorial, I would focus a bit more on the chef's hat. So if you're interested also to stick it around, we will play with it a bit. But uh, yeah, and any questions, let me know. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo. Now we proceed to the questions. OK. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Very interesting uh, talk. Um, maybe naive question. Uh, is the the strategy that you use to train the competitive uh, agent uh, does it have anything similar with the adverse with the strategy used for adversarial networks? It, 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 yes, it is somehow similar because uh, the idea is to to put together. Okay, I have the global strategy that I learned before, 
and I have the local strategy, how to make them combine. We did not use an adversarial learning strategy. In this case, we use contrastive learning. So we based on uh, try to contrast them and try to, from that get the best result. But the concept is somehow similar. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, um, maybe I'm, I'm going to ask uh, something uh, not, not uh, so related to your talk, but um, starting with reinforcement learning, and I played Pokemon Showdown. <laughs> uh, I'm not very good at it, but uh, once you're playing, you, you notice that uh, the game doesn't change very frequently. Mm -hmm. But um, at the very top, um, you have a meta game, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, um, can you account for, for this fact? Because mm -hmm. with these types of models, because uh, the meta game uh, uh, arises as a response to what the the top players are playing uh, yep. as a countermeasure, as a yeah. And, and how does uh, this fact play in, into yep. in, into these types of problems? Um, mm -hmm. I understand that, and <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if most of these um, methods um, work in a offline fashion. So. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for me. I'm just starting this to 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 visualize how how we can account for the um, uh, this fact. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that's absolutely true. So we did play the game against humans, uh, the Pokemon game. The agents. There is two types of things. If the human never played the game, mm -hmm. the agents are very good against this guy because the person does a lot of random movements and does not follow a strategy. If the person is an experienced player and plays the game very well and has a strategy in mind and builds up a team and is a very competitive player, the agent is, have no chance. I do believe it because as every reinforcement learning agent, it needs thousands, if not millions of iterations to learn very good strategies. Um, on this case, our, our we, we did ex experiences with the competitive learning agent, for example, which was our strongest agent, playing against online learning agents, that are agents that keep learning and keep adapting, right? So the competitive one is the purple one in the top. It's still the best, but it does not make the online learning agents, which is this bunch of guys here, go down performance-wise, different from the other behaviors that makes the other agents go down. That means uh, when they go down, that means that it, they are performing much worse than they were before. So while the competitive agent still plays quite well, it does not disrupt the learning strategy of the other players. So it does not change much how the other players <clears throat> play the game. And uh, we do believe that with time, and this was tested only on 10 games. So the players are playing 10 games against the same opponent. Um, we do believe it. we have more time to play, maybe 100,000 million games against it, um, the agent will learn something. But this takes huge effort to do it, and a lot of time, a lot of a lot of time. Can I ask? Uh, yes. It is a practical question. So, um, um, in, in this year, um, I have to do my kind of a thesis, but it's my final work um, to to get my degree. Yeah. So. Uh, well, I, I, I tried um, reinforcement learning uh, algorithms before and, and they are very exp expensive and, and, and you know that, but um, how easy is to get the data from Pokemon Showdown? Oh, very easy. There is this environment called PokeEnv, um, which is, uh, it runs on top of Pokemon Showdown mm -hmm. and gives you all the states, all the actions, all the rewards, and you can change it very easily. Mm -hmm. So this was quite helpful. Very, very, everything runs on Python, um, and you can create agents based on, um, we created TensorFlow agents, for example. So you can just create agents based on whatever you want and uh, make it run on this environment. Okay. This is quite nice. Okay. 
Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I have a suggestion, principally. Why in the pizza game you don't make a ranking and do the agents uh, only play with the higher level players? Mm -hmm. We can, we kind of do something similar to that when we make them play uh, against others. So we choose only the best agents to play against each other. That's a strategy you can do. Um, we also can put humans in the loop and make them play against the best humans, for example. Uh, there are many, many things we can try. The thing is, yeah, we don't have the time or the resources to try everything we want to do, but that's for sure an interesting strategy to try out. Thanks. Uh, one, one thing that might be even more changing the behavior than the, the ranks is the reward. Right now, the reward on the chef's hat is given, if you win the game, you get a big reward. So it's not based on action, but on victories. And to define a better reward, for example, you can find maybe better agents as well. <laughs>